sounds of the sanctuary. Uh, and uh, this evening we will be showcasing this magnificent piano and this magnificent pianist. Uh, we, uh, we're so lucky to have Jonathan here. I've been hearing him practicing all afternoon and it's been quite a way to spend my afternoon listening to this wonderful music and this beautiful instrument. Um, a little bit about Jonathan, as I mentioned last week, he has made over 50 CD recordings and recorded in a variety of, 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 of world uh, venues, Carnegie Hall, Notre Dame in Paris, uh, and founded a number of non-profits. Uh, his main interest at the moment is the Resonance Project, uh, which is using live music to transform conflict and find common ground. Uh, we're very lucky to have him here, uh, serving our congregation and showcasing this beautiful new piano. Uh, so without further ado, I think it's time that we hear from the instrument and then uh, we will hear a little bit more about uh, Jewish pianists and really uh, go on a bit of a journey through, uh, through, through uh, the piano music of, uh, of this concert. So please enjoy. My program tonight is uh, six pieces of music and I'd like to start where I left off last week uh, with Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn, as I mentioned last week, was famous in his day as a, not only a composer, but also a conductor and a concert pianist and a concert organist. So this piece that I'd like to play um, is Song Without Words. It's one of his selection from that, a collection of those pieces, and um, simply goes by the title Andante con Moto. And um, I find the, the piece very much like a, a flowing river, and um, I hope you find it relaxing for this evening.
That's a beautiful opening there from Jonathan with that uh, Mendelssohn piece. Uh, so I think it's appropriate that at this point we mention the, uh, the sort of Jewish link between uh, the, uh, the piano and, uh, <laughs> and our, own, our own culture and faith. Um, I guess one thing that I noticed in my research uh, in preparing for this, uh, for this evening was uh, the piano was predominantly used really as, as a way to, uh, to escape persecution and poverty. We see again and again throughout history that uh, famous Jewish pianists, whether it was uh, the Nazi regime, whether it was uh, the Soviet regime, uh, the piano was a way out and really to, to obtain, uh, to obtain a, a new life, uh, really the, the virtuosity that these people uh, men and women uh, expressed on the instrument really was a way to to elevate their social status, their economic status, and often to a way uh, as a path to immigration. Uh, a few uh, a few names really stand out for me. We had Mendelssohn before, and I'd like to draw a link between uh, Brahms and actually the Jewish piano tradition. The Hungarian pianist uh, Ilona Ebenschutz uh, was a student actually of the great Clara Schumann and she was uh, known for her recitals, debuting with the Berlin Philharmonic in 1890. And uh, Brahms actually privately premiered his piano pieces to her. Uh, she wrote of these pieces, it was of course the most wonderful thing for me to hear these pieces as nobody yet knew anything about them. I was the first whom he played, to whom he played them. On the same note, we have uh, Really, another beautiful uh, pianist, Vladimir Horowitz, who was born in Kiev in uh, 1903. Uh, he was born really in poverty. He was often for his first recitals in um, in the Pale of Settlement in in in, uh, in Moscow and, and around the Russian Empire. He was paid often in in bread and chocolate instead of money because of the economic situation. Uh, so clearly, he uh, wanted to escape. Uh, he emigrated to Berlin in 1925 to study with Arthur Schnabel, another famous pianist, and made his Carnegie Hall debut recital in 1928. He actually made the first recording of Rachmaninoff's Third Piano Concerto. So again, we see Jewish pianists throughout history really paving the way and really being such an integral force in the history of the instrument. Um, another great pianist, Clara Haskell, was uh, born in 1895 and a famous Romanian pianist. Uh, she really is the embodiment of this, of this poverty that I spoke of. She actually suffered through scoliosis and uh, really suffered through a lot of poverty and illness. And it was really only after the Second World War that she came to prominence through her uh, Mozart piano concertos. Charlie Chaplin remarked, in my lifetime, I have met three great geniuses, Professor Einstein, Winston Churchill, and Clara Haskell. I am not a trained musician, but I can only say that her touch was exquisite, her expression wonderful, and her te technique extraordinary. And finally, we come to the, the tragedy of the Second World War, and uh, really, uh, the piano was a vehicle to escape the regime. We're going to hear a little bit from Jonathan in a minute about uh, Vladis Vladislav Spilman, who was, uh, of course, the famous subject of the film The Pianist. Uh, but uh, one other name I would like to bring up was Andrea Prager, uh, who was born in present-day Hungary, uh, but who was actually a member of the Yugoslavian army. When the Nazis took over Yugoslavia, he actually uh, retreated and uh, fought as a partisan fighter before settling in Bel Belgrade. Uh, and there he taught in Belgrade until the end of his life. Uh, and he was uh, a member of one of the oldest Jewish choirs, the Baruch Brothers Choir, until he was 103 years old. So again, carrying on this train of tradition between Judaism and the piano. And now I'd like to hand things back off to Jonathan, who will uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, this link between piano and immigration. I'm guessing that many of you have seen the film The Pianist. And that film is, um, was very moving to me when I saw it, N not just because of the story itself of how a pianist, um, a Jewish pianist became, uh, was saved from exile, and not exile, from extermination, uh, because of his talent, and that a German officer heard him play and decided to, to um, help him. Very, it's a very, very moving story for, for, um, um, for Jews and for musicians. And the, the, um, the piece that's, that's singled out in the film is the uh, Chopin Nocturne in C-sharp minor. So I'd like to play that as a tribute to, to that film, to the, this occasion, this time of year. 
When I first uh, heard the the music in that film, um, I started to cry immediately. It's just there was something in some pathos in the melody that that seemed to call from beyond. And I want um, to encourage you as I play this to perhaps think about how music transforms us um, or opens us up to to possibilities that we're not aware of um, without the music as a catalyst. Chopin Nocturne in C sharp minor.
What is it that so profoundly touches the soul with, with a melody that can make you see differently, can make you feel something differently, can make you want to, to communicate when you didn't want to communicate before, could open you, can um, reveal something to you? That's the questions that have been haunting me all of my life, really, as a musician. And, and um, when you think of this film that I mentioned earlier, The Pianist, the fact that this piece of music um, touched a, a German officer, uh, and the German officer obviously uh, risked not only his career, but his life by, by helping this, this Jew, um, is, that's, it's significant. There's something in the music that helped bring that out. And the humanity that, that is expressed in the music, because the, the music has a, a vulnerability um, the person is completely exposed and naked before, before the listener. Something interesting to think about. I'd like to move next to some French music uh, from Poland to France. And although uh, there's um, the, the, the Poland to France connection already started because, as you may know, Chopin um, spent much of his life in Paris uh, when he left after leaving Poland. So, but moving ahead about uh, 50 years to Claude Debussy, and uh, this is a piece simply called Arabesque. He wrote two arabesques for piano, and this one has um, another sense like the first piece, not like a river, but, but more like a, um, um, a lake where you can see your reflection, and uh, the water has, uh, has ripples in it, and, and um, it, it has all this clarity you can actually see in. Uh, and the, the, the strange thing about impressionistic music is, in spite of the fact that the pedal, uh, sustain pedal, is down for much of, of the music, unlike its predecessor in the 19th century, um, you have this clarity of uh, as if you're looking deep into a well or deep into a lake.
staying in France and this time um, backing up in time by just a few years, uh, by about 25 years. Uh, this is some music of Foré. Um, and it is actually taken from a song. It's a piano reduction of a song. Um, the song is Après un rêve, After a Dream. And uh, I think it works as beautifully as a piano solo as it does as a, as a sung piece. Um, very striking melody and um, you'll hear the piano sing to you. So I'd like to say a word about this piano. You just heard a very low note. And you might notice how long it's still ringing. That's only true on a concert grand piano that can make this sound can come through like a ship into harbor and just keep on resonating. It's really quite remarkable how this piano sings to us. Uh, the clarity the piano has, the, the strength that has um, the really beautiful upper notes and the beautiful lower notes and the way it'll bring out a melody. It is, uh, to me, it's like playing an entire orchestra. And we have um, many people to thank, but especially um, Jim Blattner for starting the campaign for this uh, by coming to me and suggesting that we purchase a piano that really is fitting for the sanctuary. And I can't wait for you all to be in here and hear how it fills this room. So uh, warm thanks to Jim and to everyone uh, who has donated to the piano. The piano, incidentally, is built by Yamaha, and it is a um, artist piano. So an artist piano is something that is made um, about one per year, and the pi piano is made by hand and not by machine tools. So when pianos are being made in the factory, um, 
in this particular case in Japan. Uh, the, the pianos um, all have um, particular pieces of wood that come, of course, each piece of wood is unique, comes from a tree, every tree is unique, and so uh, every now and then they, they find some wood that resonates particularly beautifully. And they set that piece aside to be worked on separately and not worked on with machine tools. And uh, it's all done by hand, and then they give this extra tender loving care, and they call it an artist piano, and then it goes out on the road with a, with a Yamaha artist. So in this case, um, it was on the road for almost 15 years, going from concert to concert, concert hall to concert hall, um, being performed on by Yamaha artists. So the Yamaha artists are a, an elite group of, of exceptional musicians. Elton John is one, Michael Tilson Thomas is one. Um, you can probably find them online. We don't know exactly who the artists were that have played this piano, but now it's with us uh, for, for the for edification and the beauty of this, of this beautiful room. I'd like to next play a piece by Schubert. Um, and this piece has an interesting story for me personally. So when I was a young boy, um, I grew up in a family of musicians. I'm the youngest of four children. And all four of us turned into professional musicians. And my parents uh, were musical, although not professionally. And all six of us played the piano. And being the youngest, um, I, had the, I was the lowest man on the totem pole. So we all had to fight to have practice time on the piano. And I started piano when I was three. And my teacher was my sister. And she taught me for the very first five years until we moved. And she went off to college. And um, after we moved, I was in McLean, Virginia, just outside of Washington, DC. And um, at this point, I had a, a great love for and um, the, the pianist Arthur Rubinstein. Uh, and Rubinstein was, um, was doing the most recording uh, that I was aware of at the time. We're talking about the 60s. And um, he came to Washington, D.C. and on a tour. And my parents got a ticket for me to go hear him play. I was in sixth grade at the time. So I went to Kennedy Center, and um, he did a program, and the piece that I am about to play was actually the first piece on his program, the Schubert Impromptu in G flat. Uh, when, the, when the concert was over, I um, ran backstage, and I didn't know anything about going backstage, but I was just um, curious and um, pushed open a few doors and found my way back uh, b backstage, and there he was, standing there, about five feet from me, and, and chatting with some other people. So I walked up to the circle to introduce myself and shake his hand. Um, but sadly, uh, just as I got to that little circle, um, two feet from him, he turned on his heels and said he had to catch a plane to Chicago, so uh, I didn't get to shake his hand. But nonetheless, his music uh, and his autobiographies and his inspiration about life and understanding how he was the last of the great romantics, uh, understanding how music um, is really comes from the heart and the soul, uh, affected me all my life. So I uh, remember him. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we apologize. There seems to be a little video stall here, and hopefully we'll get that resolved quickly. Oops. Oh. 
Right, we may have had a comp complete computer crash. Oh, there we go.
I think it's fair to say that there are countless great composers, but there are certain composers that perfect certain arts. Uh, we can easily say that, that um, Bach perfected the art of counterpoint. We can easily say, I think, that Schubert perfected the art of melody. Really astound astounding uh, gift he had to, to weave a, a melody. So we come to the last piece on the program, and I wanted to say um, again how grateful I am to be uh, part of this endeavor in this synagogue and to work with Toby and to be uh, making music on this, these two beautiful instruments in this stunningly magnificent uh, sanctuary. And I can't wait for us all to be back in here together. Um, and the piece I'd like to close with uh, also has an interesting history for me. The piece is by a colleague and friend of mine named Paul Halley, and it's simply entitled Anthem. So before I moved to California in 1987, I was um, the associate music director at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City. And um, that was a great opportunity for me. I had um, lots of um, amazing experiences and worked with many choirs and from children's choirs to professional choirs to uh, orchestras, orchestras, et cetera. One of the groups that I worked with um, frequently was a group called the Paul Winter Consort. Paul Winter's um, very much still alive and still performing and um, based in Connecticut, but uh, his, he was artist in residence at St. John the Divine when I was there. My direct boss uh, at the cathedral Paul, was Paul Halley, and who wrote this piece. And Paul was the keyboard artist for the Paul Winter Consort. And as such, he was on the road with them most of the time. I was basically um, at the cathedral alone for, for pretty much every day except for Sundays. And when uh, the Paul Winter Consort was, in, was performing at the cathedral, then Paul Halley would be on the piano and I would be up in the organ loft playing uh, on the organ. So um, my second year in New York, Paul Halley had just released a solo album. The name of the album was Piano Song. And the, um, uh, during the intermission, we we're all sitting back in the office chit-chatting, and Paul Winter said to Paul Halley, hey, why don't you play something from your new album uh, in the second half of the show? Uh, everything's very spontaneous uh, at St. John the Divine. So Paul Halley said, okay, um, and then proceeded to uh, scribble out some chord changes uh, for this piece, and, um, and he handed them to me, and he said, here, play this. Um, uh, so we, we did this together in front of 8,000 people. Um, never having performed it before, I hadn't even heard the piece before. And um, so I always uh, think of that amazing moment uh, in time when I do this. And the music has this incredible effect to, to bring up associations and to um, uh, make us remember old times. And, and uh, so I, I, uh, I love working with that concept, the resonance project that you heard Toby mention before of which, uh, for which two of our congregants are actually on the board, uh, works exactly with this, about how music can bring us to a new place, transform a moment. So I hope this moment has been transformed by music for you, and I close with Paul Halley, Anthem.
<laughs> Thank you so much to Jonathan Dimmick. I'm sure that uh, everyone at home is just uh, glowing. I, I will be very honest with you. It's been a very long day for me. Uh, a, a lot of uh, different projects on the go at once with the high holidays, and I, <laughs> I came in here feeling a, a, a little dejected and out of energy, and I just feel completely uh, revitalized and. Uh, Certainly, uh, this music has moved this moment for me. So thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I think uh, Peter may be able to tell us if we have some questions. Uh, but uh, I personally, I, I would love to just ask a couple of questions. I think something that might be on people's minds going between these two concerts is, uh, Jonathan, how different is your approach between uh, a piece on the organ and a piece on the piano? And what changes in your approach to each instrument? That's a great question. So um, there's a, a f one fundamental difference between organ and piano, uh, and it will surprise probably most people. Um, the organ is, is, organists have to be conscious of the release of notes. Pianists have to be conscious of the attack of notes. So, and, and so by that I mean, of course, when you hold a key down on the organ, as long as you hold the key down, um, it's sounding. And uh, for the piano, as long as you hold the key down, it's dying. So it's doing exactly the opposite. Uh, and so um, the result is that uh, the expression, um, expressiveness of, of the, the spirit has a, it's like a different language. It's like French and German. They, they, um, they're both beautiful languages in their own right, and they, but they have their different place in the mind. And I guess... Uh, that's the simplest way to answer. The keys are more or less the same. Um, on old organs, the keys are actually a little narrower and a little shorter. Um, and the, and the uh, fingers are more curved on the organ because of the shorter keys and more flat on the piano to make a, a warmer tone of, on the piano. You can actually control the, the character of the tone by the, by the speed that you attack the note on the piano. On an organ, you can't. Wonderful. Uh, and please do, uh, don't be shy. We, <laughs> we have a little time for questions. Um, I think one thing that I neglected to mention uh, in, in our little talk is obviously today for, for Jewish pianists, uh, really scaling the heights of worldwide fame. We don't necessarily have the same problems of uh, persecution and, and needing to leave, uh, leave countries quickly. Um, and certainly familiar names, uh, Daniel Barenboim, Leonard Bernstein, who really started as pianists and uh, kind of scale the heights as, as these masters of music uh, as conductors. And I think that that's true for, uh, for many pianists. Um, is there anything you can comment on, Jonathan, in terms of the, the link between being a, a pianist and then being a composer or being a great conductor? What do you think it is about this instrument that attracts kind of this, uh, this big personality? Yeah, that's a really interesting instrument uh, uh, question. And um, the backing up a little bit uh, in history, the the with very 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 few exceptions, uh, every composer up until about about uh, 1800 was also an organist, and um, and the reason for that was because the um, organists were trained are trained uh, still in the the comp the whole. Um, the whole complexity of, of music harmony and and how uh, notes interplay with counterpoint, etc. And so it, it was a natural progression from being an organist to being a composer. And all co organists, um, especially up until 1800, and and even true today, are known for improvising. And so improvising means that you have to have a, a an ear for what's happening with the, with the with the music. Move into the 19th century, and um, and it starts to change pretty quickly with the with the piano. Although um, the greatest pianist of of, of 1800, um, which of course was Beethoven, uh, was also an organist, but uh, that was kind of the end of that um, organist composer piece, and it shifted almost immediately to pianist composer, and I think um, again it's because the the um, the close relationship to being, to not just playing a single note uh, the way instruments in the orchestra do, uh, but actually playing the the, com the entire complexion of the music, 
with all the harmony, not just the melody, is what created a natural link. Then um, uh, it's very interesting what Toby was talking about with, with Jewish pianists. And you find, especially uh, in the north, um, around Poland and, and, and Russia, and there's these, all these links between, and Germany, of course, between Judaism and, and music in general, but also uh, especially the piano. And um, I, I think that's an extremely beautiful thing. And all the pianists that I knew as a kid were Jewish. I didn't, didn't even think. Of, I didn't even think twice about it. That was just the. That was the way it was. Uh, and um, so it's it's a, it's a curious question, and 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 nice that that that, that we have this connection between um, composers and piano playing, and composers and organ playing as well. Beautiful, and uh, you mentioned, uh, I know you mentioned Beethoven, and I would really, uh, oh, we have a question. Could you tell us, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to read. Could you tell us a little bit about the tuning requirements for the piano? Is it different from, uh, from a lower grade non-artist piano, or uh, how, would, yeah, is, what is the kind of the tuning, uh, the tuning arrangement of this? Well, um, uh, lots and lots and lots of pages have been um, um, used to to talk about tuning systems. So, um, way back when, uh, Pythagoras developed this notion of, of you take a piece of string and you cut it in half, and then you have um, an octave sounding on either side of the string, and then you cut that in half and um, or in thirds, and you get an octave and a fifth. And so this whole system developed um, as we understood what music worked and the, the harmony of the stars. It was considered divine harmony. And the way um, subdivisions would work. So, if, uh, so they discovered pretty quickly when they came up with, in the Western world with the 12-note scale that if you tuned perfect fifths from C to G and then G to D, D to A, etc. By the time you get back to C, um, you should be uh, in the same place, but you're not. It's just one of the mysteries of, of tuning. Um, it, it, um, it, as a result, you, if you want to have an instrument in equal temperament, in other words, every key sounds the same, um, you have to cheat the, the interval of the fifth. I'm getting very technical here, but there's instead of a instead of a pure tone, there's a little bit of a of a wobble that the ear can hear. So that so you create a, a system called equal temperament. This was created actually not by Bach. Uh, he did a well temperament, which is a different idea entirely. Um, it was created in the 19th century. Up until the 19th century, uh, probably around 1850, uh, equal temperament didn't exist. Every key, consequently, had just ever so slightly different sound to it because of the half step and the whole steps between notes was different in C major than it was in C sharp, and in C sharp than it was in D. And so as a result, there was a whole theory that was developed around keys. Um, a minor was considered a key of anger. C major was considered a key of light and whiteness. Um, uh, F sharp is considered, F sharp minor is considered a key of red and passion. And on and on and on, there was many, many theories that went around this and um, all based on tuning systems. Our organ is not tuned in equal temperament. Um, the, the organ is, uh, was put in in 1904. Uh, the modern pitch, which is A440, 440, 440 hertz of, of vibration per second, hadn't been invented. That was invented after World War II. So in, in 1904, there was what was called international pitch, and that was A435, almost a quarter step low. So the, our organ is tuned uh, flat to modern pitch. This piano, because it's an artist piano, I didn't want to. I didn't want to monkey with changing the pitch to match the organ. So we've kept it at a 440. It's also tuned in equal temperament, uh, so that every scale actually sounds the same. And that is a very, very long answer. I'm sorry no, for a, for a, a, actually a complex question about tuning and tuning systems. Pianos in, at a 440 in equal temperament. The organ is of A434 in 
unequal temperament. What that means for uh, I think for for laymen and for singers particularly is that it's it's slightly easier to hit the high notes on the organ is what you need to take away from that because it's a little bit lower and so <laughs> actually we, we were working together on the high holidays right and it was it's interesting because your your voice is, is is so used to singing at a certain frequency and certain muscular movements and then all of a sudden everything's just a little out of kilter so it definitely took some getting used to but hopefully you will. Uh, be pleasantly surprised with uh, with our our high holiday recordings. So uh, that is uh, all the time we have for this evening. Thank you so much again to Jonathan Dimmick. Thank you, Toby. Thank you to Peter Bonos, a wonderful uh, tech Thank you, Peter. tech yes. organizer, manning several cameras at the same time and 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 all kinds of things. So uh, thank you so much, and it's been really been a pleasure being here with you this evening, and Erev Tov, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week for something completely different. We're going to look at shofarot, uh, the shofar, how it's constructed, what it sounds like, what are some of the Jewish laws and rituals around it. So please tune in at 6 p.m. next Wednesday, and then we will have our slichot that uh, Saturday evening, next Saturday. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for tuning in. Erev Tov, go enjoy some dinner. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.